And so we see in Jesus' quotation of Deuteronomy chapter 6 that love for God is foundational to Jesus' coming kingdom that we now live within. It is the beginning of a life that God has called us to live. It is the first and the last of life. It places God and His commands above every other aspect of life. And so Jesus says in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so first of all, we see from Jesus' quotation of the greatest commandment, that we're to love God. And second of all, we see loving our neighbors. Loving our neighbors. Who is my neighbor? Jesus was asked this question in Luke chapter 10, and he responds with a parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, beginning verse 29. <laughs> what does it mean to love our neighbor? Well, first of all, we have to know who our neighbor is. And Jesus illustrates this in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10, beginning verse 29. <clears throat> He desiring to justify himself said, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, putting on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, You go and do likewise. Who is my neighbor? Who is it? that Jesus calls us to love in his kingdom. <coughs> Anyone that we encounter is the message that we get from Jesus. You see, much has been made of this parable. The Samaritan treats the Jew with love and respect. Now how backwards is that? Because we happen to know that the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along very much, did they? But it wasn't the oppressor who served the oppressed. It was the one who was part of a race that was hated and mistreated, who helped the hater, who helped the hateful. Now it's, it might be easy for us to think, well, I, I'm in a good position in life and I can help those who are in a lesser position than me. But how much more difficult when we see that person who has spit in our face who thinks they're so much greater than we are in need. Because this is our neighbor. Everyone is our neighbor. Everyone we encounter. And the disciple of love, the beloved disciple John tells us how to love others in 1 John 3, verse 11 through 24. 1 John 3, verses 11 through 24. But this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of life and death because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. The other one who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding within him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our life for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. And he goes on to love. He shows us how to love our brother. Loving others is like the little children who talked about the way that the parents and grandparents cared for one another. Loving others is like the little girl who talked about giving the French fries. And giving out of our abundance and out of our need is loving others. 
And this, of course, is most evident above all in the way that Jesus loved us on the cross. 1 John 4.10, we read, we'll begin in verse 9, and this is love, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him, and in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And John goes on to say, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is loving our neighbor. Several years ago, uh, a group, uh, a new grass, they call it, group, by the name of Newton Creek, uh, sang this song, and it's always stuck with me. Um, it's called the Hand Song. It says, The boy only wanted to give mother something, and all of her roses had bloomed. Looking at him as he came rushing in with them, knowing the roses were doomed, all she could see were some thorns very deep, and the tears that he cried as she tended his wounds. But she knew it was love. It was one she could understand. He was showing his love, and that's how he hurt his hands. Now the boy's grown and moved out on his own when Uncle Sam comes along. A foreign affair, but our young men were there, and luck had his number drawn. It wasn't that long till our hero was gone. He gave to a friend what he learned from the cross. But they knew it was love. It was one they could understand. He was showing his love. And that's how he hurt his hands. Loving others, loving our neighbor means in the kingdom of God that we're willing to give for them. No matter the cost to ourselves. What a radical notion that is. How often do we see others giving in such a selfless way in the world around us? Imagine if all of us lived by this principle that Jesus has taught us in Mark chapter 12, to love one another. There would be no war. The Prince of Peace would be bringing true peace as we all follow him and his commandment to love one another. But finally, I'd like for us to look at kingdom love as I've turned it. In Mark chapter 12, verses 32 through 34, the scribe responds to Jesus' quotation of Deuteronomy 6, and he says that God prefers mercy over sacrifice, a quotation from Hosea. And Jesus says to him, because he had answered wisely, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And I'd like for us to discuss for a minute what that means. Everything that we do as Christians as a part of God's kingdom must be based on the love that we just talked about in the previous two points. Any other motivation in life to do anything will eventually fail because it falls short of God's requirement. But if the things that we do as Christians are motivated by love, they'll never fail. Hosea 6.6 6 says, For I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And so Jesus says to the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And what did he mean? And Jesus meant not only that the kingdom was about to be established upon his death, but that this man, because he understood what love was, could find his place in God's kingdom. For if we understand the love of God and the love of neighbor, we'll be led to his kingdom. Remember the rich young ruler from Mark chapter 10? In Mark chapter 10, verse 23, Jesus says this, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. What he's implying here is that if we trust in physical riches, then we'll fail to enter the kingdom. But if we trust in God and we understand the great command to love Him and to love neighbor, we can be close to the kingdom. But of course, we have to follow the steps of salvation given in the scripture to enter into that kingdom. Its entrance has already been paid for us on the cross. One, one commentator said about love, logic cannot comprehend love. So much the worse for logic. It's illogical that Jesus would die on the cross for us. But that's what's so beautiful about 
because we didn't deserve it, we couldn't earn it, but he did for us in the way. John says in 1 John 4, verses 7 through 12, it is. 1 John 4, 7 through 12. The love that let us love one another, the love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, what we read a few minutes ago, that God sent His only Son into the world, that we might live in through Him. So what about us today? If Jesus were to examine our life, would He proclaim that we are not far from the kingdom of God? We live in the time of Christ's kingdom. He is our king, the head over the church, that he has established, that he purchased with his blood. And in Jesus' kingdom, love is the greatest command. Love is not perhaps the way that we might think about it as just some icky or ooey feeling within our heart, not icky. But, uh, it is love that obeys God and his commands. It is love that obeys and loves God with everything, putting Him at the most prominent place in our life. It is love that puts others above ourselves. And it is love that is willing to give all for the sake of the kingdom, that kingdom love. In Jesus' quotation of the great commandment, the very same commandment that God gave to the children of Israel, we see foreshadowing of the way that Jesus powerfully transforms the world with his love by the sacrifice that he made on the cross. He died for our sins and established a new kingdom that is unlike any other. And so Jesus teaches us about loving God and neighbors and kingdom love. And by the loving sacrifice of Jesus, your admission is paid to his kingdom today. And if you're not yet a part of that kingdom, he invites you to come by simply believing that He is the Son, confessing that He is the Son, and turning from sin, being baptized for the remission of that sin, rising up to walk in newness of life, being added to a kingdom whose greatest rule is love. You can be added to that kingdom today. The invitation is open to you. And if you are a child of God, and you find that you're in need of encouragement from your brothers, in need of prayer to sustain your walk, then you are welcome to come as well. Whatever your need may be, we encourage you to come. Let us rejoice together in the great love that God has for us as we stand in this.